On January 20th, 1968, the world of basketball changed forever. The big show under the big top. Two undefeated teams met in the Houston Astrodome in college basketball's first nationally televised regular season game. 52,693, the largest paid audience to ever see basketball anywhere at any level. The UCLA Bruins entered the game as defending champs while riding a 47-game winning streak. And Al Sender adds insult to injury. The Houston Cougars were ranked second and featured college basketball's Player of the Year. It's Hayes over Al Sender, 17-footer, good! They're going wild in Texas! Now, 50 years after this historic event, with fresh perspective and analysis from legendary broadcaster Dick Inberg, CBS Sports' Seth Davis, and two stars from the game, Elvin Hayes and Don Chaney, we take a look back at the game of the century. Hayes again, he scores! Oh, there's gonna be a lot of tired lungs in Texas tomorrow. CBS Sports Network presents History in the Astrodome, UCLA versus Houston, 1968. We're in the Moore's Opera House on the University of Houston campus, and hello, friends, I'm Jim Nance from CBS Sports and just so delighted and thrilled to be here tonight and to be joining all of you for this celebration of the game that really made college basketball in so many ways. History in the Astrodome is what we call it. UCLA versus Houston 1968 and for the next hour we're going to celebrate the golden anniversary of that event. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with you, Dick. Why was this game so important to college basketball? Well, in many ways, uh, it, uh, it set the standard and orchestrated what the future was going to be. At the time, there was no national television of the college basketball game. And this was the first time in prime time it was ever carried. And it was the intersection of the great game of college basketball with television growing medium. And just think about it, fans. There was no TV, and now on any given night during the college basketball season, you can watch 25 games. And so it really, this was, uh, to me, the, historically, the most important college basketball game in history. This was a regular season game, and not even a conference game, by the way. In terms of the competitive nature of that season, it was rather insignificant. So it was the atmospherics, the timing, uh, the two great stars, Elvin Hayes and uh, Lou Alcindor, the UCLA dynasty, people didn't have a chance to see college basketball on their televisions until this game. So this game, I think in all the sports really transcended the competition in a way that no other game did in any other sport. And so much of it leading in really was about you, Elvin, and Lou Alcindor. Now, we all know he later became known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but we're going to call him Big Lou, Lou Alcindor tonight, because that's who he was at that time. So, so much of the focus in the game was about that matchup. He was just a young kid at that time. What was it like for you in the build-up to this? You know, to me, uh, I got to know him when I was a, a sophomore. We played in an NT2A tournament out there, a regional out there at UCLA. And I was introduced to him. We became instantly kind of good friends. You know, I saw him, he called, we went by his hotel, we hung out. We went record shopping, we went shopping all over, and it was really amazing because about six months ago, he was talking to me, he said, hey man, you remember we went shopping for records and all of that? But then after about, after that UCLA Houston game here in Houston, uh, it, it was a thing where we had no more friendship for a very long time and didn't talk for a very long time. To this day, Don, how often do you have people come up and talk about the game of the century? Almost on a daily basis. I, I, I'm just amazed at how many people remember the game. Or those who were not there still claim to be there. So. But uh, the, the, the scariest thing to me about that particular game was, uh, and I can remember this very clearly, when I was told that the game was going to be held at the Astrodome, the first thing that came to mind was, who in their right mind would play a basketball game in the Astrodome? You know, and it was just that amazing, you know, that they were similar to something like that, and it turned out to be an unbelievable situation, an unbelievable game. Again, it was 1968, and there was truly only one place worthy of hosting this historic event. 
is known as the eighth wonder of the world. The Astrodome, truly the eighth wonder of the world. On April 9, 1965, the Houston Astrodome opened its doors to the public, revolutionizing the world of sports and entertainment. It's the greatest sports facility or entertainment facility that anyone has ever conceived. For more than 40 years, the Dome played host to every type of event imaginable, welcoming presidents and preachers, Elvis and evil, Muhammad Ali and Billie Jean King. The Astrodome, this big, beautiful stadium, the eighth wonder of the world, the fanfare was just tremendous. The Astrodome was a building that people wanted to see, wanted to visit, wanted to be at to say they've been there. In the 60s, the mecca of sports was the Astrodome. There was no other place like it. The Astrodome, the luxury dome, totally controlled environment in the space age concept to accommodate more than four million persons annually in absolute comfort. The Astrodome changed the sports world. People tuned in to see the spectacle. Put entertainment in a venue like the Astrodome, people will want to watch it worldwide. In 1967, at the Final Four in Louisville, two of the nation's top big men met for the first time. One was a little-known center from Rayville, Louisiana. University of Houston Cougar, Elvin Hayes. On the other side of the court was the biggest star on the nation's most dominant team. UCLA All-American Lou Alcindor. He was leading John Wooden's number one ranked and undefeated Bruins. So let me tell you something about 1967. We had an average margin of victory of 26 points a game. We were never really pushed in the NCAA tournament. They were like the New York Yankees of, of college basketball. Lefty Lynn Jackalford from the corner. They just were a powerhouse. That's Lucius Allen, the scores from close in. We had three things that made us great. One was Lou Alcindor at center. He hits, and UCLA is up by four. He was arguably the greatest college basketball player of all time. Secondly, he had a great supporting cast. We were loaded. And then we had John Wooden, who kept it all in perspective. And John's going after his third national championship in the last four years. UCLA controls the opening tip-off. From the opening tip, Hayes tried to take the ball straight at his taller counterpart. Right off the bat, Elvin went in for a dunk. Alcindor's blocked Elvin Hayes. And we had never seen anybody block Elvin. It sent a message real quick that they're here to play. And when you see Lou come out and slap that out, see, that threw us all off. Six foot seven foul shoots, and Alcindor takes it off the board. It was just hard to guard them, and, and, and what they did as far as penetration, dishing the ball off, it, it was tough. This time, it's Shackleford beating Alcindor, and he lays one up. Nothing would go in the basket. Alcindor turned, and he blocked Bell's shot. And everything would go in the basket for them. That's Mike Warren with the tap in. Beautiful jump shot near the baseline. Jabbar was making everything. The big man proves his scoring ability on a beautiful feed from Shackleford. We won. It wasn't an easy win. Final, UCLA 73, Houston 58. For us, 15 points was a close game. But we thought they were good, but we thought we were a much, much better team. I think we thought we played together better. I think what we came away with was how good they were, what we would have to do in order to, to, to play with those guys and to beat them. Houston's fiery coach, Guy Lewis, didn't take the defeat well. As soon as the game ended, he had revenge on his mind. After, you know, they lost that game in the Final Four, and he brings the team in and says, listen, y'all want to play them again? <laughs> Let's do it in the Astrodome. We all said that, yes, we, you know, we would like to see them again in the Dome. Welcome back to the Moore's Opera House at the University of Houston. And you just saw some of the highlights from that 1967 Final Four. It was a national semifinal matchup between the two powers. And that really was kind of a precursor to the matchup that would become known as the game of the century. And again, we're joined here by Elvin Hayes, Don Chaney, Seth Davis, Dick Imberg. And I heard Elvin talk about how the coach was setting you up to play, Don. Let's go play UCLA again next year. 
Well, he probably thought he was talking about the NCAA tournament. In the meantime, he was talking about this regular season game that, that Coach Lewis had in his head, that he wanted to create this special event. We had no idea of the dynamics of the whole deal. I mean, I, I can remember uh, prior to the game uh, saying, well, we got a game against UCLA and Astrodome. I think Coach picked that moment to come in there since, you know, we just had lost and uh, he was a great person to motivate you. He was a great motivator. And he'd come in and he'd say something. We felt, oh, he's just joking. He's just trying to get us up and saying, hey, we're going to play in the Astrodome because, as Don said, who would do such a thing? Why would John Wooden agree to this game? Here's what happened. Eddie Einhorn was a visionary. He saw the value of college basketball on television before any of the networks. He was way ahead. He had little syndicated, with TVS was television syndicated, so he would get stations around the country to syndicate to his games on a, a, on a regional basis, and now he puts together, with Guy Lewis, this big game. He goes into J.D. Morgan, the athletic director at UCLA, and Wooden's saying, no, 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 I don't want to do the game, and Morgan sees the money, and he says, we're going to do the game. They, they shake hands. Okay, the deal is done, everyone's happy, and Morgan says, wait, one more thing. You've got to use our announcer. And Eddie Einhorn didn't know me from a broken rim. And, and he said, who is he? He said, Dick Enberg. He says, is he any good? He said, well, he's done our games for two years. And that's how I got the game. My very first national telecast was J.D. Morgan looking at Big Bucks, and he said, give Enberg a shot. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> While John Wooden was reluctant to even play the game, Houston coach Guy Lewis was working tirelessly, trying to ensure that this game would not only happen, but that it would take place on the biggest stage possible. Coach Lewis, who was a huge promoter of basketball, he really loved the game, and he knew he had a great team, and he knew that UCLA had a great team, and he felt it would be a, a spectacle. He knew long before anyone that college basketball was a marketable product. And he envisioned all that, and he sold it not only to UCLA, John Wooden, but also to Judge Roy Hoffines, who had been the one to build the Astrodome. The judge was sold, the venue set. But the question remained, how do you physically play a basketball game in a dome? Judge responded and said, God, how in the heck somebody's going to see a basketball in that big stadium? And the guy responded, Judge, they play baseball in that stadium, and baseball is a hell of a lot smaller than a basketball. It was hard to realize how that would take place. You know, where would the game be? Where would they put the floor? There were never basketball games that were in huge facilities. We have no idea how the setup was going to be until we went out to the practice. And to see the floor in the middle of the Astrodome, and just to get out there, it took forever from, from the dressing room. Center court is now probably 100 yards from the center field fence. And the benches were actually dug into the ground where you sat. It was like trenches. When you wanted to go on the court, you had to step up, it was to help people be able to see in the stands. It wasn't our home floor. In fact, it was a Los Angeles floor that came in here to the Astrodome. So we were playing on the California floor. When you put that basketball arena in there, they focused the lights so you could light up the basketball arena. Of course, when they did that, you couldn't see the backboards. The reflections off the lights were so strong. So they actually had a guy go up and hand at the top of the Astrodome and start unscrewing lights so you could see the backboard. There was a lot of things went on just to get it to where the thing goes. It wasn't just, bam, set it up and everything's perfect. The stage was set. All we had to do is what we were capable of doing, and that's go out, play the way we could play, and win. In 1967, UCLA and Houston met in the Final Four with the Bruins and Lou Alcindor defeating Elvin Hayes and the Cougars. When the rematch was set for January of 68, all eyes were on the battle of the big men, Big Lou versus the Big E. It was obvious the matchup that everybody had been waiting for. Lou Alcindor, he lays one up. There were 
Very few players like that that dominated the way they did. The Biggie shows why he's an All-American. And that's what made it so special. In my opinion, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, is the greatest center that's ever played basketball, ever. Well, Lou Alcindor was the dominant player in the country. And we had a guy that, in Elvin Hayes, that thought he wanted to be that player. Elvin has a lot of pride, and he'd been hearing about Lou Alcindor for years. When it came right down to it, he had a chip on his shoulder. You know, here's a guy that got no publicity, no credit for any of his accomplishments, and uh, he had the opportunity on the big stage, and he had a point to prove that night. With the game less than two weeks away, the unthinkable happened. A University of California player comes in, Alcindor pulls away as he's been struck in the eye. UCLA's biggest star had just become the game's biggest question mark. The previous weekend, before we had the Astrodome game, the game of the century, uh, Kareem had his eye scratched in a game against Cal. And Kareem was in the hospital. And so there was some question as to whether he would play or not. After 10 months of hype and anticipation, the question on everyone's mind was the simple one. Would Alcindor play in the game of the century? Thanks for joining us on the University of Houston campus. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the game of the century. And as you just saw, just eight days before the showdown with Houston, UCLA's Lou Alcindor in a game against the University of California suffered a scratched cornea. So, Seth, you spent all this time with Coach Wood, and I know you spent hours talking about this game. What was he thinking? What did he share about the lead up to this game, the injury, the anticipation of taking on undefeated Houston down in the dome? Coach Wooden really didn't want to play in this game. And uh, a lot of people would like to have the high class problem of coaching Lou Alcindor and having won a championship and having this huge uh, reputation. It was a lot of pressure uh, on John Wooden. And the injury to Alcindor just made it worse for everyone. Uh, Don, for the for the Houston Cougar team, though, the injury to Al Sindor, did, did you think in the days leading up, uh, as he was held out of a couple of games before this one, that, you know, we may have this big occasion, this spectacle, and he's not going to be there? What, what, what was the team saying? Well, I don't, I don't think the injury was that much of an impact on our preparation for the game. Uh, we, we look forward to the game. We thought we were better. Um, so it doesn't matter if he were, had two eyes or... When I, it didn't really matter. Uh, you know, and a lot of teams, when you have an injured person, you say, well, we're going to take an advantage of the injury. I don't think the thought process was there for us. We came to play and we came to win. Have you ever convinced Elvin that he was not going to play in that game? Did you, did you ever think that was a possibility? You know, it's one of those things that uh, I, I, I felt that, you know, he was going to play because the night before at the hotel, I had gone over to his hotel and we talked and visited. And they were talking about how they were going to beat us and come down to this cowboy town and beat us and get on out of here and get back to California. And uh, it, it, was, it was one of those things that, uh, you know, I couldn't wait for the game. And when I went into this game, my main focus was he was the most held it and most terrific player to ever come out of high school into college. And to me, that night meant to me and to get an opportunity to play against him was to take his bright, shining star out of the sky and to replace it with mine. And that's, that's what I really was looking forward to, playing and going head on head with him and uh, for our team to win and for us to be successful. And I don't think that any of us that night thought about here you know, 50 years later, any other time that this game would be so profound on, on our careers and on our lives as this game was in 1968. Because I think the realization came when, when we came out of that locker room and those big green doors opened and all of a sudden it was a reality. And it, it was like, it's on. And everything that, that I kind of have waited for and had prepared for 
it was here, and now go do it. Well, you've just done what we call in the broadcasting business. That's a great tease. That's a way to set up the game. Up next, that first half, we promised, when we come back. For the past 10 months, since the 1967 Final Four, the talk of college basketball had focused on the rematch, UCLA versus Houston. Neither team has lost a game since. It was treated like a prize fight, full of hype and intrigue. 150 stations nationwide agreed to broadcast the showdown. It was staged in the most unique of all settings, the Houston Astrodome. One versus two, the game of the century. UCLA and its 47 game winning streak against an undefeated Houston team looking for redemption. We were very confident and that started with Coach Lewis. He asked me point blank, he said, do you think you can beat these guys? I said, coach, we're gonna win. Our best player, Lou Alcindor, had been in the hospital all week long. Alcindor was playing with a scratched cornea, injured in a game just eight days before the showdown. But the injury was not the real problem. No, the real issue was Houston's Elvin Hayes. Don Chaney, the quarterback. It is Hayes underneath, he scores! The great Elvin Hayes, the great Big E. Inside down center, Bakes goes up, blocked by Hayes! Elvin would come down and with that beautiful jump shot where he just extended his arm so high and swished one shot after another, my reaction was, oh my goodness, is this guy ever gonna miss? It's Hayes over Al Sender, 17 footer, good! And Griffin off to Hayes, the score! Cougars in front, trying to hand UCLA a major upset loss here in the Dome. Inside Hayes, over Lynn, over Al Sender, score! The Bruins can't stop Elvin Hayes in this first half. Elvin Hayes is putting on a one-man show. We'd never seen a better half out of any ball player. I mean, he was phenomenal. We've all been to baseball games where you hear the, somebody hit the ball and there's a roar in the background. Well, that's the way it was with this. Oh, there's gonna be a lot of tired lungs in Texas tomorrow. Hayes has 29 tonight in this first half. 29 points and a half against UCLA was unthinkable. Well, I think after you've won a championship, going 30-0, and 0, and then you win your first 17 games the next year, you think you're pretty invincible and you just can't lose. They led 46 to 43 at halftime, and it was a very, very strange feeling. We're on the University of Houston campus as we celebrate the history in the Astrodome, UCLA versus Houston, 1968 the game of the century. So it was pretty amazing to see that video. And you did come out with one of the great performances and Dick's voice was hitting some decibel levels that were pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about it, I'm 33 years old and I'm on national television. What am I doing? What the farm boy from Michigan doing in this scene, you know? And, uh, and I, I go back to the fact that if it had been even normal in terms of the way you would call a game, I'd called a lot of basketball games by then, but we're in a foxhole so that our heads were just above the ground so we didn't block the uh, view of the people in the box seats. The box seats, by the way, sold for $5. They were the worst seats in the house. You couldn't see anything. <laughs> Elvin, did you realize this was a spectacle? I mean, again, you're just a young man at that time. And in my life, I got to live my dream because I got to play at the time the greatest player who had played the game of basketball, Lou Alcindor at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that he was that player to me. And it was that moment for me to beat him. And in that game, you know, I was just feeling it. I, you know, I didn't care where I was on the floor. I knew that I had the shot and the shot was going to go. It was just, it was that moment, it was that night, it was that time, and it was, it was Cougar basketball time. The way Elvin played, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It, it didn't matter at all, because Lou Alcindor was a great player, no question about that. And naturally, I'm sure he probably felt that his eye you know, prevented him from doing the things he, he's capable of doing. But the way he played, it doesn't matter. He played unbelievably well. You know, every, every player dreams of a night where nothing can go wrong. And it was like that for Elvin. Everything he threw up went in. Alcindor, with one eye or two eyes, wasn't going to stop the man down here for the big year.
Wooden didn't use the word great about his own players. That was not in the vocabulary. But after that game, he said, Elvin Hayes in that first half, that's the greatest individual performance I've ever seen. Welcome back to history in the Astrodome. UCLA versus Houston, 1968. After one half of play, this game and all the hype surrounding it, my goodness, it was living up to all those lofty expectations. That's a rare thing, Dick, as you and I know so many times, these big events, they fall apart. But this was 46-43 Houston at halftime. And Elvin, you had poured in 29 points. And UCLA and Lou Alcindor were, were clearly having fits as Houston was double teaming him down low. Can Spain behind him, you in front of him, all that. Before we get to the second half highlights, I'd like to discuss a little bit, Don, I'm going to start with you, the mood in the locker room. You guys went in, he's got this, you know, performance of a lifetime the first 20 minutes of the game. You're up three, though. You're not up 13 or, or 30. So what was, the, what was the mood? Well, I, I don't, you know, I think going into the game, first of all, we had a lot of confidence. So going into the halftime with the lead wasn't a surprise to us because we thought we were better or as good as this team. And so being up, we had a lot of respect for them as a team, but being up, we felt that we were at home and we were rolling and we had our star really rolling, that we felt we were in driver's seat and uh, we were where we should have been, actually. We talked about Alcindor, the eye injury, but you believe, Elvin, that the way that Guy game plan against Lou had so much to do with the fact that he had a four for 18 performance from the floor that, that game. Yeah. Tell us what you guys did. Well, you're talking about a, you know, a guy who is seven foot four, and what we tried to do is, if I was guarding him down low, then we would have Ken Spain coming over me to intimidate the shot, because he had never had anyone to really challenge him like that. With a great scores, you, you don't really stop great scores. What you do is you throw off their rhythm. And that's what we tried to do with him. We threw off his rhythm. We, got, we didn't let him get into a rhythm with that sky hook looking down on you, swoom, swoom. But we threw it off. He, he had to adjust it. When he went up, well, here come a big hand coming at you. It was a different story now. And uh, I think that's what really made the difference. Seth, what did you think? Well, the thing about UCLA is during this whole time, especially with Lou Alcindor and the program, they were not used to playing in close games. So for them, this was just uncomfortable all around. And this was a team that, in a lot of ways, was kind of coming apart at the seams. Again, you'd think, boy, they're winning all these games. Everything is hunky-dory. But, um, you know, people want their points. They want their attention. There's jealousies. Uh, this is a tumultuous time in Southern California, 1968. There's a lot happening externally. So this was a team that was already frayed. And I don't think, I know that they were not prepared to be this uncomfortable on so many levels. And they're going up against a really good team and a great player who's hot and very well coached. Uh, I think there was a lot of discomfort all around through this whole experience for UCLA. At halftime, we knew we'd hooked into something. It was going to be special that Alcindor wasn't as good as he might have been. And let's not forget, too, it's almost like a boxer that's unbeaten, but then he gets a cut for the first time, and he sees it, and he, it changes his whole career. Here was Alcindor. He was about to maybe lose his first college game. Ooh, man, we had something that was really special. Well, you teed us up perfectly. Let's take a look at the second half with Dick at the mic. We go to the second half. Dick Emberg and Bob Pettit at courtside. Of course, Elvin Hayes with that fantastic first half of play, officially with 29. Inside Al Center, Bakes goes up, blocked by Hayes. With Lou Al Center being dominated by Elvin Hayes, the Bruins needed a change. Our best player, Lou Al Center, had been in the hospital all week long. He was out of shape. Al Center with Spain on him, blocked by Hayes. He was not at 100%. He did have trouble shooting under the basket. Gal Sindor, way off the mark. I think in the second half, he, more than any of us, got a little more tired. Mike Warren came up to me and said, I think I'm going to go ask Coach to take Lou out of the game. I think we can run these guys. Lucius Allen with a big steal. I said, I agree. We can run these guys. But I don't think that's a good idea. Don't do that. Houston leads by five. Seven and a half minutes remaining in the game. Let's face it, they had a great team. Uh, they had uh, great shooters. I mean, 
you, you had a complement of players there. They were deep. Mike Warren, 20-footer. Our problems, of course, were with the guards. Mike Warren and Lucius Allen, they were both All-American. Alcindor, Warren, score. Extremely fast. Cheney on the solo, and Allen saves the basket. Great shooters. And any one of those guys were capable of beating us. Allen along the baseline, scores, and he is fouled. Allen and Warren combined for 38 points in the game. And Allen's two crucial free throws, with 44 seconds left in regulation, tied the score. Lucius Allen tied the game up 69-69, and then we had the ball. Lee to Hayes, blocked by Nielsen, but he fouled him in the process. You know, Elvin is a good free throw shooter, but when you're in a situation like that, you're tied going into the last half minute or less of the game. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. Welcome back, friends. We're revisiting all the history of UCLA and Houston, January the 20th, 1968. We talked about chaos, the chaotic final 30 seconds as we were going to break. Elvin's heading to the line to shoot two, and let's pick up the finish of that game. Jim Nielsen picks up the personal foul, and now it's Elvin Hayes with the pressure. Elvin had to make these two shots, you know. We needed them. Hayes steps to the line. He has already accounted for 37 of Houston's points. They love the big A and, and has a little force rate. It's 71-69. It got kind of hectic, but I mean, it was, uh, it was bedlam. I saw Ken Spain get a rebound, and the official signaled foul. And then he went to the traveling call. Traveling against Spain of Houston. I was sitting next to Coach Lewis on the bench, and his towel was waving up and down, and he was yelling at everybody on the court. And the Bruins get second life. Houston leads by two. A pass was going to Lynn Schalkenberg, and Mike Warren deflected the ball. I think Mike thought he was coming to him, and the ball got deflected. Went out fast. Houston, of course, will try to kill the 12 seconds and hold the ball and run the clock out. We had the ball up by two points, and Elvin took it upon himself that he was going to dribble out the clock. Hayes with the ball. I was hoping Elvin wouldn't lose the ball because he was not a good ball handler. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was like you just stopped breathing. It seemed like time stood still almost. It just couldn't be over fast enough. I still get goosebumps to this day when I think about it. We'd won 47 straight games. We didn't know what it was like to have the buzzer go off and us to be uh, on the losing end. So it was really, really strange. It was special for the entire city. It went beyond the University of Houston gaining credibility. Just as the Astrodome put the city of Houston on the map, this basketball game put the University of Houston on the map. The whole country knew that there was a new star on the landscape of college basketball and basketball of the future, and his name was Elvin Hayes. It does not hurt to talk about the game of the century. It was a great night for Texas. It was a great night for Houston. It was a great night for Elvin Hayes and his teammates. And of course, the fact that college basketball could become a money-making sport, that was discovered that night. 50 years later, what's it feel like to look at that, Don? It's almost as if it was yesterday. It's really amazing. I mean, I, I, I had a, a great career as a player, a great career as a coach, and people still remember that game. Yeah. I, uh, I'm remembered for playing in that game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Should people be. just won't forget. And for you, here we are on this milestone anniversary, Elvin. You know, I scored on, I scored over 27 some thousand points in the NBA, and I had some great games. And you know, no matter, but everywhere I travel, everywhere I go, everybody 
the first thing they say, hey, I saw you play in the UCLA-Houston game. You played in the UCLA-Houston game. And that, that, that game, have, it totally shattered everything that I did in pro basketball or even after I left U of H. But that, now the only part I would cut out of that film is that last three, few or three seconds with me bound that bump. You know, it, I, every time, you know, no matter how many times that I see this basketball game, I say, why don't somebody get the ball from him? How did he get it? Because, you know, there's your bar there, there's all, all around. All they had to do is get it and put it right in. And I was so glad to get that ball to George Reynolds. And uh, that was the worst part of the game for me. Game of the century, it, it lived up to it, didn't it, Sam? You, you know, by the time you got to the game, calling it game of the century almost felt like an understatement. And I know that, Dick, you've talked about, you know, what would have happened if UCLA had won by the margins they had been winning by, or even won by a close margin. The fact that Houston won, to me, not just because I'm here and I want everybody to like me, but was really the, <laughs> the, the, the coup de grace of, of, of this event. It was the arrival of the sport, the perfect situation, and the perfect outcome. Yeah, it was a perfect storm. And Elvin Hayes, a great player, the player of the year, has his greatest game. It's a great game, too. It's a two-point game right down to the final seconds. You can't ask for, for more than that. And, and in the years that I did uh, UCLA games, nine years, they won eight national championships. I was pretty good. Uh, the, uh, uh, that, that when they lost, it was such a big event. And, and in a way, even though I, my association was with UCLA, as you left that night, they said, wow, that, that, that was about as great as it'll ever be. Because all the, all the points, as you say, with the perfect storm, big game, big crowd, first time ever televised nationally a college game, and then to have this remarkable, magical performance by Elvin Hayes in Houston winning. Well, to ask Don and Elvin what it felt like to, here we are on the 50-year anniversary, what's it like for you to listen to your call at the end. I think you can't uh, argue with any announcer in that situation for me. I think my voice was a, an up an octave right from the very start. You just had a sense, you know, you, you, you can feel it. You've been at big games where you just feel it's going to happen. This is going to be a great game, and it did indeed live up to being the game of the century. And a lot of people want to say 1979, Magic Johnson against Larry Bird. I did that game too. No, no, this was the game that catapulted <laughs> basketball into the outer spaces. That leads us right into break. We're going to come back with a final thought about the legacy, the living legacy. Dick, you couldn't have said it better already about the game of the century when we return on CBS in a moment. Two months after the game of the century, on March 22nd, UCLA and Houston met again this time at the Final Four in Los Angeles. The Cougars entered the contest ranked number one in the nation, but had two major issues confronting them, a motivated Bruins team and a healthy Lou Alcindor. The Cougars quickly realized that this is a different Lou Alcindor than the one they controlled in the Astrodome. The Bruins, powered by an early 21-5 first half run, led by 22 at the half and never looked back. The UCLA scoring machine that averaged 93 points a game this season is not to be denied. This time, Elvin Hayes was limited to 10 points, while Alcindor dominated the interior with 19 points and 18 boards. Guy Lewis, this is not the Astrodome. UCLA won in convincing fashion, 101 to 69. A day later, they defeated North Carolina to secure their fourth national championship in five seasons. Welcome back to CBS Sports Network's special presentation of history in the Astrodome, UCLA versus Houston. 1968. I have loved this chance to look back with all of you. Dick, I don't know how you can top it, but give me a legacy moment, too, about that night, being a part of it, being able to relive it with all of us this evening. When the game was over, uh, I interviewed John Wooden. He was very gracious and in defeat, as he always was. And then uh, I wanted to, I didn't want to leave the Astrodome. I said, how do I get up to the very top level? Of, of this stadium. So someone kindly took me up an elevator and I kept climbing up steps and I finally got in one of those suites and I looked down on the scene and at the time I thought, this, this was really a dream. This was a beautiful dream and how lucky we are, how privileged I was to be part of something so, so incredibly great. 
Seth, what is the legacy of this game? Well, you know, someone I've uh, covered college basketball now a quarter of a century, so the popularity of college basketball on television literally feeds my kids. And uh, I think of this game, and I thank this game for uh, being able to do that, for showing uh, the country and the world what a beautiful game this is, to see young kids in the prime of their life, coming of age as young men, in the most intense, pressurized situations, coming through, being happy for each other, being a team, being a family. To me, it's everything that's great about uh, sports and college basketball, and this is the game that did it. Don? I, I look at this game as the game that really put the Cougars on the map and the city of Houston. What a great game to be nationally televised, and the first one. And people have a tendency always to rem remember the first. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's been implanted in all our minds that, you know, forget this game. Because it was a great game and the first. So, Elvin, this is the old Houston Post headline on January 21st. It says, Hayes scores 39, Alcindor 15, Cougars upset UCLA 71-69. What will you always remember about being such a vital part of that night? I will remember that we had a University of Houston basketball team that ended the season with the winningest record in college basketball that year in the regular season. We, that team did not get to leave the Astrodome and go and play in, in, in the NC2A finals. But one thing that I always can remember is that we won a game. We won history that night. And UCLA, no matter how many championships they won, they never could get history back. Elvin Hayes. Bless you. Don Chaney. Seth Davis. Dick Inberg, the 68 team, come on up here. Come on up here, guys. <laughs>